raise my eyes toward the mountains. Where will my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. I've calmed and quieted myself like a weaned child on its mother. Wait for the Lord from now until forever from now. Look at how good and pleasing it is when families live together as one. It is like expensive oil poured over the head, running down onto the beard. The Lord will protect you from all evil. God will protect your very life. The Lord will protect you on your journeys, whether going or coming, from now until forever from now. All right, last week we started a series in what are called the Psalms of Ascents. The Psalms of Ascents are 15 psalms from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134. Uh, They are songs that if you were a Jewish person that you would sing on your pilgrimage to Jerusalem three times a year. So they would, the whole country would make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem for, for Passover, then again 50 days later at Pentecost, and then in the fall, during the, the Feast of Booths or Feast of Tabernacles. And as they would go, especially on that last leg as they were coming up into Jerusalem, because everywhere from everywhere you go up into Jerusalem and then up into the city and then up into the temple, you would, they would sing these songs. And they were reminders as, as they were on this journey, reminders of God's goodness and his blessing and his mercy and his power and his presence in their lives. And that's what they're there for us as well to do, to be reminders of, of God's work in our life. So I'm gonna invite you to stand as I read the, uh, the psalm for this morning. We'll be looking at Psalm 131, and we just wanna stand in, in reverence for the word of God and not acknowledging that these are God's words to us. Psalm 131, a song of ascents. My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I have calmed and quieted myself. I'm like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am contempt. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore. Would you pray with me? God, I pray that, that our hearts would be open to you this morning. Give us eyes to hear, eyes to see, ears to hear. Uh, what your spirit is, is teaching us this morning. And then give us a desire to follow the voice of the spirit in obedience through your word in our lives that we, in doing so, might become more and more like Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. Nothing like saying something weird and funny during a prayer, right? Give us eyes to hear and ears to see. Now you're going, what is this guy praying about? Um, All right, so the the theme of this psalm, by the way, this is one of the four psalms of ascents that is written by David. Ten of them, we don't know who wrote them. One of them, we know that Solomon wrote because it's in the title, and then... Four of them, David wrote, and this one is about contentment. Great topic when you're traveling. Great topic. I mean, have you ever done a road trip with your family? You would pray to God your children will be content. You find ways to make them content, or at least quiet, in the back seat. And there's so much more you can have these days with, with, you know, tablets and all that kind of stuff. My day, we, we colored and teased your sisters. That's what I did for fun when we traveled. And so I didn't get to travel much as a child because I was an instigator and so I wasn't invited. Uh, but, but contentment, great topic for travel. Webster's Dictionary defines contentment as rest or quietness of the mind in the present conditions, satisfaction with whole, which holds the, the mind in peace, restraining complaint, 
opposition or further desire, and often implying a, a moderate degree of happiness. And, and in this psalm, there's a beautiful picture of what contentment looks like. In verse 2, it says, I've, I've calmed and quieted myself, David says. And, and the word calm, the, picture, the, the word in Hebrew has this picture of like a, a still lake, that just that smooth, glassy water. And, and quieted not only means quiet, but it means it, means it rest. It means waiting. And the word myself is, is, is an interesting word. It's the word nefesh, which means soul. So David says, my soul within me is still. It's at peace. It's like that, that high mountain lake that you just get up in the morning and nothing has disturbed it. He says, I'm like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child, I am, I am content. And in his culture, a, a weaned child would have been a child who was uh, three years old, about three years old. And the picture is of this, this three-year-old who's now lo- no longer being breastfed, resting against its, its mother. And it, it says, I'm like a weaned child with its mother. You could also translate that, I'm a weaned child upon its mother. So it's a great picture of this child who previously would have received its provision from the very place on which it's laying its head, but now no longer, and it still can remain content and quiet and calm. If you have ever been around a hungry baby, you know that's not how babies who are hungry act at all, full stop. Uh, We get to watch our, our granddaughter uh, Callie, we became grandparents three months ago, and, and so two days a week, our, our daughter-in-law has to go to the office, and so Kelly and I help, help watch our little granddaughter, and she is so cute. Like, she just started doing the, the talking thing, you know, and she's a little girl, so she talks a lot. Like, I know what we're in for, because she's just like, and we'll sing songs, and I'll say, your part, and she'll go, she knows. It's great. She's smiling, she's laughing, she laughs at my jokes. What's not the like? But when I'm feeding her, if I have to adjust and take the bottle out of her mouth for a moment, let me, let me tell you, I have learned that my, do- my granddaughter has lungs like me. She is so loud, she can scream so loud and just outraged, outraged that I would deign to take this thing out of her mouth. It's shocking, and I just start cracking up. I'm like, hey, you just, you get way too worked up for this, all right? I'll be right back with the bottle. That's the picture. A, a, a hungry child is anything but calm and quiet and content. No way. But this child, this child that, that David is writing about, is, is lying on, on the very thing that not too long ago was the source of provision. But now, it doesn't have to get all fired up, all worked up, because she has learned that mom is going to provide just in a different way. And so I don't need to worry. I don't need to get worked up. I, I don't need to be like, like that, that still placid lake that someone throws a giant boulder in the middle of and it just bursts up and splashes and there's ripples and waves. My soul doesn't have to get like that, this child, because I trust that mom knows I'm here and she will take care of my needs. And there are some definite things in our lives that want to destroy contentment. And I want to talk about just a couple of those today. There's a lot of them, but I want to address just a few. Um, Enemies of contentment, things that can cause you to be discontent pretty easily. And the first one that wants to sabotage your contentment is worry worry, anxiety. And I think a lot of times, and maybe I'll just speak for myself, a lot of times uh, I worry because I want to be in control. And when I'm out of control, I feel anxious. Is that just me or you guys, anybody struggle with that? Where you just want, you need to control outcomes. You want to 
You want to make sure that what, what you're thinking in your mind that life should look like, it happens that way. And so you're going to do whatever you can to, to try to influence things and, and manage things and control things so that this good can happen. And when it doesn't, you feel anxious. This happened to me this week. This week. I, I, I mean, it's always hilarious. I'm like, I want to go, can I preach on something really easy, God? Because... I got to roll through this stuff a lot of times, all right? So this week, middle of the week, I'm up, I'm trying to get to sleep at night, and I feel like I'm having a heart attack. I'm just so anxious, and I realize, it, I was just anxious, and I'm like, what am I so worked up about? And I started thinking about it, and I went, you know what? None of those things are in my control. I can't do a thing about that. And, and do you know that there is no such thing as control? There isn't. There's no such thing as Psychologists will tell you, experts will tell you, there's no such thing as control. There's only the illusion of control. And so when we think that we can be in control, you are always going to be on the losing side of that proposition. You can't do it. And so what will happen is if you're trying to do it more and more and more, you will become more and more anxious. Jesus said in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, therefore I tell you, don't worry. Don't worry about your life what you'll eat, what you'll drink, about your body, what you'll wear. Don't worry about that stuff. Instead, seek first God's kingdom. Why? Because God is actually in control. God is the only being that exists that is in control. So seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and then all those other things, all those things will be given to you as well. And next chapter, Jesus is, is talking about prayer. And he says, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? Only dads who think they're funny, right? Bad sense of humor dads. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? You worry about so many things. I worry about so many things. And what Jesus is saying is, don't worry. Just give it to God. Seek him first. And all the things you're worrying about, God is going to handle because you are trusting him. And when you trust him, the anxiety comes down, the worry comes down, and the contentment starts. But only if you'll trust him. Contentment is rooted in our trust for God. But when we struggle with our trust... When we struggle with belief, because really that's what it comes down to. Do we really believe that if we seek God first and his kingdom, that he will actually give all the other things to us as well? Do we really believe that? Do we really believe that if I pray, God will give good gifts to his kids? I mean, maybe I believe that from somebody else, but I don't know if I believe that for myself. And we may not say it in those words, but that becomes how we live our lives. In fact. And that will always, always destroy your contentment. Another thing that can destroy your contentment is this. Do you know what this is? Yes. Do you know how you say it in Spanish? I learned this. Chupon. This is a chupon. Now this is not actually, actually a pacifier is not what it is. A pacifier is what it does. What it is, is a false nipple. It is, it is a thing that you put in a child's mouth to make them think that they have what they really want when in reality you put something fake into their mouth and so they have put their trust in a false reality to give them a short-term contentment. And if you know anything about kids, pretty soon the jig is up and they go, that is not what I want. My, three, my three-month-old is like, she looks at me sometimes like, Papa, what are you doing? Like, I'm three, but I'm not stupid, okay? Three months old, I'm not an idiot. I want to have actual liquid coming into my body, sustenance. And you want that. That's what you want. You want that. But what happens for us, what happens for us is instead of trusting God and experiencing contentment, we don't do that. And just, just like our kids, we, we try to soothe ourselves on other things. And just like a kid, they reject the pacifier eventually because it doesn't provide what it promises. And again, for kids, that's good. You want that. 
it would be weird if all of us never rejected a pacifier. And you're all sitting in here, I'm looking at you, and you're all sucking on a pacifier. That would be weird and off-putting. Right? Who does that? You know who does that? Us. We do that. When instead of trusting in God and allowing him to provide for our needs so that we get to experience his contentment, we decide that we're going to handle it ourselves. And, and so uh, we, we don't believe God and we just try to do it ourselves. We try to create peace in our lives uh, by controlling our lives. Uh, we try to soothe ourselves in our own power, in our own strength. We, we try to medicate the things that are, that are hurting inside of us rather than taking them to God. We try to keep busy so we don't have to deal with the things that are bothering us. Um, even with God, we try to do everything that God would want us to do so we can get his attention, so that we think if we can get his attention, then he will love us and he will answer our prayers. And we settle for the pacifier. And we convince ourselves that that's what we actually want. Dangerous little things. They, these things in our lives, and instead of trusting in God, we trust in pacifiers of our own making, they will destroy your contentment. Another thing that can do this for you is not understanding God's provision for you. It's interesting. You can see how this worked. Like when they're going to Jerusalem, right, you can see that this is a great psalm. It's short, it's sweet, but it's right to the point because it deals with what you would experience when you're traveling. Lack of contentment. I mean, it wasn't an easy journey. There were things you would worry about. There were, there were things that you would try to, again, because you're worried, you try to self-soothe or worse, you, you try to do it for other people and you give them platitudes. Anybody ever done that for you? Like you're going through something really hard and people are like, oh, you'll be fine, you know? No, I won't be fine. Like my arm just got cut off and I'm bleeding. I think I need a tourniquet, you know? Like those kinds of things. Now maybe not physically you need a tourniquet, but maybe emotionally you need a tourniquet. Spiritually you need a tourniquet. And, and it's, we give platitudes out as pacifiers. David says in Psalm 131, my heart's not proud, oh Lord. My eyes aren't haughty. What he's, what he's saying is my, my heart, for, for a Jewish person, that was the, the center of your, your thoughts and your will. To a Greek, it wasn't. To a Greek, your heart was where you thought and your mind was where you chose to, to, to control your will. That's why when you read the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy, it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And when Jesus in Mark quoted that, Mark being written to a Roman audience, Jesus said, love the Lord God, with your heart, with your soul, with your mind, and with your strength, because they would have then understood the heart piece of what this verse means. So, so what's within me, in my mind, in my will, I'm not proud, God. I'm not going to trust in my own thoughts and my abilities and my intellect. Uh, my eyes are not haughty. The eyes are a poetic way of saying my whole person. I, I don't exalt myself as to be something that I'm not because I don't concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. Those are words in the Psalms that are used of God's salvation with his people. David's saying, I'm not God. I don't try to be God. I don't want to be God. I'm going to allow God to be God in my life. I'm going to trust him for his presence and power and provision in my life so that I can be like a weaned child upon his mother, like a weaned child, I can be content. And this is probably a good place to talk about provision because a misunderstanding of God's provision is another reason that we get all twisted up and lose our contentment because we have an idea about God's provision. And it, and it comes from, I know for me, this verse, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in, what is it? green pastures, and he leaves me beside still waters. Now me, my idea of green pastures was this. Oh, that's green pastures, right? Sheep, I'm like, this is us. This is our Christian life. God's taking us these green pastures. They're, they're waist high, and we lay down in it. Oh, it's so nice. We grab grass when we're hungry, and we just eat it up, and it's just fun, and we frolic. It's great. 
<clears throat> that is not David's picture of green pastures. What David pictured when he wrote it is this next picture. That's what David pictured. See these? There's the sheep. See him? That's David's picture of green pastures. That's actually the part of, that's actually the part of uh, Israel where, the southern part of Israel where the, all the shepherding happens. And so when David writes about green pastures, this is what his picture is. See that? <clears throat> this is what the sheep eat down where the sheep are when David would wrote, when David wrote Psalm 23. They, the shepherd would take him to these little tufts. It's another picture of what one of these tufts look like. Yeah, just little, little sprouts <clears throat> of, of grass. And the shepherd would lead his flock from one set of, of stuff to another set of, of stuff and if you go to Israel with us in January you'll see sheep like this and they'll be grazing on these little tufts on the hillside and so for a shepherd in Israel which is what David was when he writes about the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want I, I, I'm going to trust in God's provision I have no want because he provides for me because he leads me to green pastures that's what it looks like and so the biblical concept of provision isn't waist-high grass <coughs> that we just lay in and grab by the fistfuls. The, the, the biblical idea of provision is that the shepherd will lead the sheep to grass for today. And if you're a sheep, you're going, huh, I don't see no more grass. And the sheep have been around a long time. They'll go, don't worry. Shepherd will take us to it tomorrow. How do you know? Because I've been around a while. And every day, the shepherd always takes us to green pastures. And that's what God does. He takes us to green pastures. Every day. Provision for today. We, we want provision for today and the foreseeable future. That's what we want. But that's not really the biblical pattern of God's provision. Remember when, when the Israelites left Egypt, they're out in the wilderness, in the, in, the, in the desert. And in Exodus 16, the Lord says to Moses, he says, look, I'm gonna rain down food from heaven for you. <clears throat> and each day, the people can go out and pick up as much food as they need for that day. And I will test them to see whether or not they follow my instructions. And on the sixth day, they will gather food. That will be Friday. They'll gather food, and when they prepare it, there'll be twice as much as usual. Why? Because the Sabbath is the next day, and so they're going to prepare it, but they won't work on the Sabbath. So twice as much on Friday. So here's what happens. People of Israel did as they were told. Some gathered a lot because they had bigger families. Some gathered a little because they had smaller families. But when they measured it out, everyone had just enough. And those who gathered a lot had nothing left over, and those who gathered only a little had enough. Each family had just what it needed for that day. Then Moses told them, don't keep any of it until morning. That's what we would do. We're like, well, what about tomorrow? What if there's none tomorrow? Because we get that there were some today, but we're out in the desert. What happens if? But some of them didn't listen, and they kept some of it until morning, and by then it was, it was full of maggots, and it had a terrible smell. The picture of God's provision was for today. And you know this, we, we pray this almost every week, right? We just prayed it a few minutes ago. Matthew chapter 6, verse 11. Give us what? Our. Whoa, is it tomorrow? No. Is it our weekly, annually, rest of our lifetime bread, big storehouse full of bread? We don't have to worry about it. Just go out to the back of the storehouse, get some bread. No, give us today our daily bread because God wants us to trust him for tomorrow's bread and you know how he'll give you tomorrow's bread because he gave you today's God is my shepherd and just like a shepherd he will lead me to grass every day and you can bank on it how just ask people been following the shepherd a while and they'll tell you which is what happens like you know I don't know if you, you you look at people and you're like, man, they have such faith. They have incredible trust in God. You ask them, they're like, it wasn't always that way. I didn't always, I didn't always do this. In fact, I'm not always perfect. You may think I'm really great. I'm not that great all the time. 
Sometimes I don't trust like I wish I would. But they'll tell you that, that one day I just said, that's it. I'm going to trust God today. I'm going to trust him for today. And, and then God showed up. And they went, wow. God, God showed up. And they went, wow, I think I'll trust him for tomorrow. And, and God showed up. And that happened over and over and over and over and over again. See, I think God doesn't give us tomorrow and next week and next year our weekly, annually, millennial food because he wants us to build our trust muscles. And the way you build your trust muscle is to trust God and see him work and then trust him again and see him work. And you're like, oh. And you go, hey, let's do it again. Oh, he's still working. This is great. This is fantastic. See, our problem is we want the benefits of trust without actually exercising our trust. We want the benefits. We, again, we, we want today our bread for the future. But God says, no, I'll give you your daily bread, but I'll give it to you tomorrow, but you still got to trust me. You still have to trust me. I want you to trust me. And when we do, that is a thing that begins to build into our life this sense of contentment. The reason I wasn't feeling content this week is because I was trying to manage all the things that were concerns to me. Instead of going, God, this is a concern. I'm going to lay at your feet. I need help. And only you can help. That sounds a lot like the Bible, right? Don't be anxious for anything. But in everything, by prayer, supplication, make your request known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart, hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And the flip side is also true. If you don't do that, you'll be anxious about everything. And you'll have no peace, and you'll have no contentment. Come to me, Jesus said, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Your burden is heavy because you're trying to carry it. Come to me. Come to me. There's risk and trust. Always is. When you trust somebody, you have to trust that they will do what they say, and honestly, they've got to trust that you'll do what you say. And there's times when you don't trust because you've been burned. You know, you trusted someone uh, and, and they said they would do something, they didn't do it. Or they said they wouldn't hurt you and they did hurt you. And, and for very good reasons, you may struggle with trust because there's always risk involved. But when it comes to God, there's never any risk because God is always faithful and true and he will never, he never cannot be faithful and true. Second Timothy says, if we're unfaithful, even if we mess up, he is still faithful for God can't deny who he is. So the only thing that stands in my way the only thing that stands in your way, our way, in trusting God is our own issues because God will always be faithful. God will always be true. He will always be trustworthy. It's just our stuff, our stuff that keeps us from trusting him. Our need to control it, our need to pacify it, our need to, to think differently about what God has told us about provision. Rather than going, God, I'm just going to trust you. And, and, and Thursday night, when I was having trouble sleeping, I felt I was going to have a heart attack. I was just so worked up. I finally had to go, God, this is my problem. And it's a problem because I've decided to make it my problem rather than give it to you. And so, God, I give it to you. And I trust you for the outcome, whatever it might be. I trust you. Contentment comes when we learn to trust God. And we do it, and we notice when God answers. We notice and we remember over and, and that's what the Psalms of Ascent are about, remembering over and over and over about how God will show up. He will be our help. We can put our faith and trust in him. And when we do, we experience his contentment. So three quick questions before we wrap up. What, what are you worried about? What am I worried about? What is it in your life that you feel anxious about? And perhaps could it be like me this week? It's just because you haven't, you've decided to be in control of it. You decided to take it. You decided to try to affect the outcome rather than saying, God, this is too big for me. I can't handle it. It's all yours, and I'm going to let it go. I'm going to trust you. Second question, what are your pacifiers? What do you have in your life that you have traded true contentment for, for a false contentment, a pacifier? What is it that, that, in you that you're trying to soothe or medicate 
or keep busy so you won't have to deal with? What false things are you putting your trust in? Because when you do that, that's how it looks. That's how it looks. What do you need to release to God so that you might begin to experience his contentment? And then lastly, am I exercising my faith muscles, my trust muscles? Because that's what it comes down to, learning to trust God. And again, the picture for me that is so powerful is this picture of the shepherd. The shepherd will lead his sheep to what they need today. And today, my God, your God, will supply your needs according to his riches in glory. Paul wrote in Philippians, he said, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed, hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, and here's a secret. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Contentment is always about our choice to trust God, to take him at his word. So I pray for you, and I pray for me, because listen, I'm in the same boat. May we learn to live and trust in God's presence and power and provision in our life so that, like David, our souls might become calm and quiet and content. And that's our prayer, God, that you would do that in us as we trust you. And that is, honestly, I have full confidence that if we will do that, that you will answer and that you will Give us a deep sense of peace and contentment in our lives. Help us to learn every day to trust you for today. And let tomorrow be tomorrow. May we learn that you are a good shepherd. And so, Father, as we take this prayer into the coming week, I pray that you would help each one of us live for you each day to the full and being true to you in every way. And, and Jesus, I pray that, that we would be kind to everyone we meet, showing your love and your compassion, your grace to them. And, and Holy Spirit, I pray that you would give us a, just a love for people who are far from you, that you would give us your heart for the lost and that we might proclaim Jesus, not just in everything we say, but in, in all that we do. And I pray all these things in, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.